So while uh, Jack is making his way over to the uh, podium, um, I probably don't need to do a commercial for Employee Benefit Research Institute. You all know it's the gold standard here in, in our zone. And uh, so the backdrop here is for several years now, um, we've been pestering Ebri to do certain types of research. And today, for the first time, um, I won't steal Jack's thunder, but we're, we're seeing the results of what we call a perfect portability system. And uh, I think you'll find the results most interesting. And I'll turn it over to Jack. And if you need any help, just turn over here, Jack. Cause okay. Thank you, Spencer. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, Francis. Thank you for making this available to us. And Spencer, thank you for the invitation. Although when it comes to doing a presentation on portability, I don't think I'd be your poster boy today, given my um, <clears throat> lack of mobility, but I'll, I'll try my best to, to carry this through. If I could just go back to the slide, title slide first. Uh, what we're going to be working on primarily today is a very quick summary of some of the work that Spencer has mentioned that we've been trying to do with auto portability. And we'll define some of the terms in a couple of seconds, but there's two things that we really want to stress in this presentation today. One is on how auto portability will help with increased accumulations. So we're gonna be taking a snapshot, typically at age 65 or retirement age, to see how much difference it makes. After we get done with the first part of that, we're going to do a second part and look at retirement deficits. We've actually done a lot of simulation work on different types of reform scenarios and how much difference they might make with respect to the overall retirement deficits, something that the Senator had mentioned. And we're going to basically show just how much of a difference something like auto portability could make. So if you could go to slide two, uh, I want to be very careful when I put together these different scenarios for you because we're going to be doing a lot of comparisons. So let me spend a couple minutes talking about, first of all, the full auto portability that we simulated. Quite simply, what we're doing here is we're saying every participant, 401k participant, will consolidate their savings in a new employer plan every single time they change jobs. So if retirement age is at 65, all participants are going to get to 65 with a single account. So that means that there will still be leakages, as the Senator had mentioned, but in this case, the leakages would be limited strictly to what would come out in terms of hardship withdrawals. Now, as a corollary to a full auto portability, we also modeled a partial auto portability. Now, the index, the threshold here is a little bit arbitrary, but given safe harbors for IRAs, we thought $5,000 would probably make sense to get started. So in this case, every participant who's got less than a $5,000 count balance indexed for inflation, at the time they change jobs, would consolidate that savings with their new employer. So basically, if you've got $5,000 or less indexed for inflation in your account balance, at the time you change jobs, again, there will be no leakage. The leakages would be limited solely to hardship withdrawals. All right, now we're going to need something to compare the numbers that we get from those two scenarios. So the third thing I look at is the baseline, which is just the status quo. It's what we have today. And in addition to hardship withdrawals, there's going to be a participant specific. And this will depend on things like age, income, account balance, how long you've been with the employer, and type of plan, a participant specific probability of both cashing out as well as loan default leakage at job change. Okay, so try and keep those in mind. We're going to have these three different things uh, circling around here. What I'm going to do with those numbers, second major bullet point, is I'm going to compare the present value of accumulations at 65. Although sometimes as we start letting these time horizons run through, some people will get cut off before 65, in which case I'll definitely note that for you. But we're going to look at the present value of accumulations at 65 under both the full and the partial auto portability, and we're going to compare that with the status quo and we're going to look at how much additional accumulation you would have at retirement 
under the full and the partial auto portability. We're going to segment that by a number of things. We're going to look at age cohorts. We're going to look at age-specific income quartiles. And then we're also going to look at time horizons so you get an idea of how these cash flows will play out over time. When we get done with that, I'm also going to then jump ahead and look at what happens with overall retirement deficits. I'm only going to look at the full auto portability in this particular case for you. But again, it'll give you not only an idea of how we're doing on the accumulation side, but then also when you also look at the decumulation, the post-retirement period, how much of a difference does it make vis-a-vis -vis some of the other scenarios. So if I could go to slide three, please. So we're going to do the accumulation increases. The first graph here is basically looking at the present value of the additional savings at 65. So this is an addition to the status quo that I've already modeled or the end of the time horizon if earlier on the full versus partial auto portability. So let's start all the way over in the left-hand side. What we're saying is for the blue, which is the partial, the $5,000 index, there would be after 10 years for all these individuals, 25 to 64, an extra $266 billion accumulated as a result of that. If you look next to it, to the red bar, the full auto portability, you would expect more because we're not just limiting to those with 5,000 or less index, and that jumps up to 472 million. You can see how these will increase with time. I go all the way out to a 40-year time horizon on the right-hand side because if I'm starting at 25, that's how far I'm gonna have to let those numbers play to make sure everybody can get all the way out to 65. But if you go all the way to the far end, after everybody who's currently 25 to 64 has an ability to hit 65, I'm getting an extra one and a half trillion dollars with the partial auto portability, and I'm getting 1.9 trillion dollars under the full auto portability. Now that's putting everybody together, so let's go to slide five and see how that breaks hey, Jeff, out. Hang on one sec, age. if you would go back, I just want to make a point. And then you discounted all those dollars back to 2017, is right? Yeah, so these right. are all billions of 2017 dollars. I used Social Security intermediate assumptions as far as CPI to take everything back to today. Okay, so on slide five, now we're going to give you some breakouts of those big total numbers. And as you would expect, I mean, without even doing any simulation analysis, you just know it's going to make more of a difference for the young people than for those on the verge of retirement who are going to have less time to benefit from this portability, auto portability situation. If you look at people who are currently 25 to 34 under the partial, I have 659 billion more in accumulations at 65 than if we would have stayed with the status quo. If you go up to the full auto portability, you get 847 billion. And again, as you would expect, both the partial and the full are going to decrease with older age cohorts because they have less time to benefit from it. If you go to the very end for the 55 to 64, that'll get you an extra $41 billion under the partial and an extra $74 billion under the full auto portability scenario. Now, if you could go to slide six, I also wanted to look at income. Now, I'm not actually looking at dollars here. I'm looking at percentage increases. If you want more discussion of that in the q and I'll, I'll be glad to go into the technical detail why. But I also want to point out that on the bottom, I have lowest, second, third, and highest income quartiles but these are age-specific income quartiles. So I'll take everybody 25 to 30, and I'll figure out what the breakpoints are for the various quartiles, everybody 30 to 35, et cetera. So these are not going to, in essence, be contaminated by having older people having much higher income when I set those boundaries. I, I think probably the most important figure here is to look all the way to the left-hand side at the lowest income quartiles, Again, I have it broken out by age. The blue are the youngest, um, 25 to 34. And you're always going to have the biggest impact for the youngest cohort. What you see here is you can get a 24.6% increase 
Again, these are the accumulations at age 65 under the partial. This side is partial, the next side will be full. The, under the partial auto portability scenario, uh, for those that are the youngest, 25 to 34, in the lowest income quartile. You get some decrease as you go from the lowest income quartile to the others, but given how low that threshold is, there's really not that much of a drop off over the different quartiles. If you look at slide seven though, I trade the partial we just looked at with the full auto portability scenario and now you do see, first of all, larger numbers, as you would expect, because, you're, again, you're not just giving the benefit to people who had $5,000 or less in for inflation at uh, job change, but, th but this will apply to everybody. And, in fact, if you look at the lowest income quartile for the youngest cohort, we're coming up with a total percentage increase of 36% under the full auto portability scenario. Again, hey, hey Jack, could you put that in dollars? What what is the uh, you know what's the delta here? I see it in percentage. Let's just use the lowest income quartile. Yeah. If you would go, if you would convert these to dollars, although there'd be a huge technical caveat if I had a footnote down here on why this is a little bit iffy. But if you just look at the numbers for the people in that. Highest bracket, the 36%, the lowest income and the youngest age category, that would turn out to be approximately an extra $38,000 in 2017 dollars if you discount that back from when they hit 65. Hmm? Yes. So, and again, you, you see now also you get a bigger play as far as the impact of income quartile that the larger the income quartile, the smaller the overall impact, as you would expect in a situation like that. Because, again, under status quo, you have cash outs that are primarily based on age, income, and account balance. And because the lowest income quartile does have a lower account balance, they would have a higher probability of cashing out had it not been for the full auto portability scenario. So if we could go to slide eight, I'm just going to shift gears now and spend a couple time, a couple minutes not on what's the accumulation at 65, but now we're going to look at the full retirement deficit simulation. And I'm not going to go through all the details on this, but what we've been doing now, and this is a slightly different age cohort, this will be 35 to 64 as opposed to 25 to 64. But Craig Copeland and I now, since 1999, have been looking at a full retirement income adequacy model for the entire country where we look at both a retirement readiness rating that will give you the percentage of simulated household life paths that do not run short of money in retirement. So we put together all the various sources of income and retirement wealth. We look at the various expenses. We put it all together and we say, for this particular cohort, what's the probability you will not run short of money in retirement? That's the probability of successful retirement. But most people would say, well, that's nice, but if somebody misses having enough money by a dollar, that's much, much different than somebody who's going to miss it by 10000 or maybe $100,000. So what we're going to focus on in the next slide is what we call retirement saving shortfall. And all that does is it takes the present value of the simulated retirement deficits at retirement age, which we're going to assume is 65 for today. I really need you to focus on the caveat that this only includes households simulated to have a deficit. Okay, If I'm only looking at retirement deficits, I'm only looking at people who run short of money. A lot of the benefit from auto portability is going to extend to people who don't run short of money. So this is only showing a part of the overall benefit that you would get from auto portability. So if I could go to the slide 10. Now, this is going to take a little bit to explain. I've looked not only at auto portability, which is the bottom row on the grid on the bottom, 
but I've also compared that to an auto IRA, not the patchwork state auto IRA system that we currently hear so much today about, but basically had the federal proposal ever seen the light of day. So just as a benchmark, what would happen if every employer who didn't have a DB or DC plan put in an auto IRA with a 3% contribution for the employees, no match for the employer, and just to be incredibly optimistic, I'm going to assume nobody ever opts out. So you put in the 3% each and every year. We realize there's going to be some opt-out. We just don't know how big it's going to be. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. And if you want to look at the very youngest cohort that we model, 35 to 39, of all the retirement deficits I have aggregated for that age cohort, if auto IRAs went into a place basically today and nobody opted out, I could get an 11% reduction in their retirement deficits. And obviously, as you get older, you have less time to benefit from the auto IRA, the impact is going to be less and less. For those on the verge of retirement, I can only give you a 2% reduction in deficits. Okay, the middle row, I'm going to get to auto portability, I promise, Spencer. The middle row looks at another benchmark. And this is kind of the benchmark as far as how good could you possibly do if every employer had a retirement plan. I'm not going to use the M word. There's no mandates floating around here. But just as a simulation to say if every employer who doesn't have a DB or DC plan today would adopt a DC plan and have one similar to other employers in that firm size. We know that larger employers tend to do more generous provisions than the smaller employers, so all that's accounted for at best. So this is completely takes care of the access problem. Everybody's going to be eligible now. This is going to use empirical contribution and opt-out rates from everything that we have been studying now with, with ICI since 1996. At best, we can reduce those overall deficits by 28%. So that's kind of a, if everything goes perfect as far as access, that's as good as you're going to get. Okay, the whole setup is, so how does auto portability compare with that? So the full auto portability that I modeled for you just a couple slides ago, if that went into place, you almost double what you would get under an auto IRA situation, and although we're not getting all the way up to 28%, you still take a very healthy cut out of that, and this is without any increase in eligibility or access. If you had the increase in access that this had, you would obviously end up with a number even larger. Okay, so the next slide. Uh, just very quickly on next steps. Um, there's a lot of simulation work we're still doing on this. And again, I would welcome any comments, suggestions, either during the Q&A or feel free to... Um, Send me an email at vanderheideber.org. Be glad to talk to you about this. Uh, alternative assumptions. We used an incredibly conservative rate of return assumption for what we did in the accumulations today. Um, we wanted to make sure that nobody thought we were, in essence, fudging the numbers or biasing them upward. So we ended up using a deterministic rate of return of only 6.45% nominal for equity and 3.15 for non-equity. Basically, what we do typically when we run these things is use stochastic returns based on historical um, distributions that would give you a much higher accumulation rate of return. Updated cash out assumptions. Um, I've been fortunate to get some, some confidential information from record keepers, and we're updating that now. So some of that is going to be uh, applied to the next version. IRA withdrawal parameters. Even though we're assuming under the auto portability situation that you're not basically going from a 401k to an IRA rollover, you have to have the IRA withdrawal parameters to get the status quo correct because so much of the information right now we have in terms of, okay, if you roll over from a K to an IRA, that money is not necessarily going to be immune from withdrawals from that point until retirement age. 
and we've been trying to figure out using government data how to come up with that. We have that already embedded in the model, but we're also going to be working with, with Craig on the EBRI IRA data to try and get some more exact information. Structural design, I only showed you a 5,000 or a full auto portability. We're going to do many intermediate uh, thresholds also. And also, we're going to introduce auto portability leakage. Right now, we assume that once it went in there, we didn't lose anybody. We didn't have any leakage occurring. This is something that we're going to have to do some sensitivity analysis around, but that will be in the second part. And then finally, I would be amiss if I didn't tell you we've got no behavioral assumptions in this yet. It's really difficult because we have no idea where to baseline some of this. I would welcome any suggestions. But things like, how would the existence of auto portability impact participation activity? Are people going to think, well, I know I still have the option of taking the money if I want, but they're going to automatically put, myself, put me into one of these clearinghouse situations. Am I going to be less likely to participate in the first instance or not? That's something that's got to be reflected. Same thing with contribution activity. Are people going to be as willing to put in as much as they would have if they had the status quo? Asset allocation activity, people could probably make the hypothesis that some of these individuals might necessarily think, well, if I'm never going to have a chance to get my hands on the money at job change anyways, I've got a much longer time horizon, and that might result in a higher equity allocation overall. Again, these are the types of things we're going to have to figure out. And then finally, plan design parameters. Somehow, we're going to have to go to the employers to see if any of this is going to make any difference. Uh, uh, voluntary enrollment, automatic enrollment, automatic escalation, are any of those going to necessarily be modified if you think that your employees are going to have this money basically ending up in the clearinghouse and ending up with overall balances that are much higher at the end? And just a very long appendix. If anybody has any really tricky questions at the end, I reserve my right to go back to that. But thank you very much. So we're in special circumstances here with, with Jack and his back pain. I invite any questions now because I'm not sure where he'll be 40 minutes from now. Uh, but uh, that's a great, that's great body of work, as you said. Great start. Lots more to go here terms of understanding the full impact, but we'd invite any questions from our, our participants today. And there's one. Um, I reserve the right to um, punt on those types of questions, because I think that's going to be what we're talking about next. Uh, but if the question is, how did I, what did I assume for the modeling? If for the model, I assume that everybody would automatically end up in the auto portability situation under the full, and then under the partial, as long as your account balance was less than that $5,000 index for inflation, you'd automatically end up there. Let, let me partially answer your question. What we set out to do first was to find out what the outer boundary was. What's kind of the maximum benefit? That's not a policy or a, de or a feature designed into what, what's going on right now. We're going to be doing the research to understand kind of once you get the high, mark, high water mark, where's reality? Right. No, that, that's exactly right. And you, you know better than anybody else what I have in the model all set to go next. And what Lou's referring to is um, we had a joint publication in 2010 uh, where we looked at the impact of auto escalation on overall retirement income adequacy. Um, one of the most important parameters when you do these simulations is whether people remember or forget where they were on that auto escalation path. So if you've got somebody who started at three, had auto escalated up to 
and then change jobs and they come in and they're automatically enrolled again, but the default is three, do they go back to three or do they remember they were at six? So what this does is assume everything starts over from scratch. So this is the not remember scenario we had in that joint publication, but basically all I got to do is flip a switch and we'll see the impact of that. A absolutely, right, right. 